Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. This is part three of the Pairwise Alignment Lectures. Over the last couple of lectures, we talked uh, generally about the problem of pairwise alignment and why this is important in bioinformatics. We then talked about one specific algorithm called needleman wench Global Pairwise Alignment that's very commonly used to align full-length sequences. In this lecture, we're going to talk about a couple of variations on the needleman wench alignment um, to look at some variants that we also use very frequently. Um, and then we'll talk about the runtime of pairwise sequence alignment by doing some simulations and exploring how long this algorithm takes on sequences of varying lengths. The first variant of needleman wench that we're going to talk about is uh, an algorithm called Smith-Waterman, which is used for local pairwise alignment. The main difference between Needleman-Wunsch and Smith-Waterman is that Needleman-Wunsch is a global aligner and Smith-Waterman is a local aligner. Depending on, uh, well, first let me define what that means. So in a global alignment, you are aligning a pair of sequences, sequence one and sequence two, say, from beginning to end of both of the sequences. And that's what we saw when we worked through an example in the last lecture. With a local alignment, um, you're not necessarily interested in aligning the sequences from beginning to end, but rather identifying the highest scoring sub-alignment um, uh, that can be achieved from that pair of sequences. And so what that means is both the alignment can begin in the middle of uh, either sequence one or sequence two, and it can end somewhere else in the middle of sequence one and sequence two. And so you end up um, aligning only potentially a subset of the characters that were in your input sequences. Now this may initially seem a little surprising. Why would you want to do this? Um, there's actually a number of very important applications for this. Um, so for example, imagine that you had a gene sequence and you were trying to identify where in a full length genome that gene sequences, that gene sequence is found. In that case, you wouldn't, you could use pairwise alignment for that, but you wouldn't want to use a global pairwise alignment because you're not interested in aligning the, your query sequence. And so that gene sequence to the full length genome, you're just interested in finding it in that genome. And so it wouldn't make sense to require that the alignment begin at the beginning of the genome and end at the end of the genome. Um, similarly, this is how the BLAST web server works. And so when you run a BLAST search, you are um, specifically running a local pairwise alignment search, and you're finding a small, uh, potentially smaller sequence than your query in the reference database. Um, a time when uh, uh, that can be useful um, for example, to not align your full query sequence would be if there were some artifacts of sequencing in there. Um, and so, for example, some of the sequencing instruments that we use will attach a what's known as an adapter sequence. Um, this might be, say, 25 nucleotides in length. Um, and this is something that the machine re relies on, but is not actually part of the biological sequence. Um, so this could be something that's artificially inserted into that sequence as part of the um, sequencing process. Um, in that case, if you were to search your full length sequence with an adapter against a database like one of the BLAST databases, you could get an alignment that wouldn't include those first 25 bases. And that would tell you that that is not part of the match, that um, those first 25 bases of the sequence are not something that was found in the database. Um, so I'm saying here that this is, Smith-Waterman is a variant on needleman Winch. Um, what I mean by that is that these algorithms are almost identical to each other with just a few minor differences. If you know how to compute a needleman wunsch alignment, you also know how to compute a Smith-Waterman alignment. You just have to follow a few different um, formulas. Um, so first thing I have up here when I um, contrast these two methods 
is that the goal is different. So Needleman Lunch is doing a global alignment, Wolf Smith Waterman is doing a local alignment. Um, the way that this ends up um, being achieved is um, uh, through a few modifications, um, the first of which are to the scoring scheme. Um, and so you can notice in here, this is the scoring scheme that we worked with last time. Um, so you'll remember like this is where we ran the gap penalties um, down the uh, rows and then along the columns. Um, well, in Smith-Waterman, the initial scoring of the first row and first column of the matrix is actually easier. You just get zeros in all of those cells. And the implications of that will be obvious in a minute when I compare uh, the F and T matrices that we would get for Needleman, Lynch, and Smith-Waterman. Um, the other difference here, so initially these two function, these two scoring functions may look very similar. So we've got the max, and remember, this first line corresponded to um, substituting one amino acid for another. Um, this one here uh, uh, was um, for inserting um, a gap. This is also for inserting a gap. And remember, we computed three different values, and then we took the max of those values to figure out what to put in a cell in the dynamic programming matrix. With Smith-Waterman, we just have one additional term in this um, function, and that is the value zero. And so what that means is that you compute everything in exactly the same way as you did for needleman Winch, but if all of the values are negative, then you score a zero in that cell. Again, um, the implications of that will be clear in just a minute when we look at the next uh, slide. Um, there's two minor differences in traceback as well. So with Needleman Wunsch, recall that we started tracing back at the bottom right of the matrix and we finished tracing back when we got to the top left of the matrix. This ensured that we were transcribing amino acids from both of the sequences from beginning to end. In Smith-Waterman alignment, we do this a little bit different. The uh, traceback starts where we have the highest score in the matrix. And so that uh, may not necessarily be the bottom right cell. And traceback ends when we encounter a zero score in the matrix, not necessarily when we get to the top left of the matrix. Following this algorithm guarantees that we will have the highest scoring subalignment from a pair of sequences. So now let's take a look at the matrices that would be generated for each of these. Um, and so these are um, screenshots from the book. And so when I did this um, on my tablet last time, I, I did F and T in the same matrix, um, just to make it a little quicker to write out. Um, when I do this in the book um, and on these slides, um, you can see I'm doing F and T in two separate matrices. And so this first column here is my F matrices and the second column here is my traceback matrices. Um, so this should look familiar from last time. Um, same with this traceback. Um, so if we compare that to what we get with Smith-Waterman, um, what you can see first is that the first um, row and the first column are all zeros. Um, so remember that this formula or sorry, this formula over here um, says that the first row and the first column are all going to be zeros in Smith-Waterman alignment. The other thing that you'll notice is there are a lot more zeros in this matrix and there's no negative values in here. That's because anytime a negative value would have been um, would have resulted from all three of these formulas, we end up scoring with a zero. 
Um, and so that is represented in the dynamic programming matrix as a lot more zeros. And it's represented in the traceback matrix by a lot of these um, termination points. And so recall um, that we use this single bullet to indicate that we are done transcribing the alignment. We should stop when we reach that point. In uh, Needleman Wunsch, there's only one of these. In Smith Waterman, there is uh, one of these terminations anytime we have a cell with a zero in it. So if we were to trace back the Smith Waterman matrix, um, the first thing that we would do is identify the cell that has the highest value in it. Take a minute, figure out where that is. Um, and you should have probably identified this value of 28. What we would now do is we would find that corresponding location in the traceback matrix, and we would be ready to trace this back. And so we would move diagonally um, up from the left here, and we would transcribe an E and an E. We would move diagonally again. We would transcribe an H and an uh, sorry, we would move diagonally again, bringing us up here. So we would just uh, transcribe an H and an H. Then we would transcribe a G in our top sequence and a gap in the bottom sequence. Then a W and a W, an A and an A. And we would then terminate our pairwise alignment because we have reached the end of the sequence. Um, and so maybe take a minute um, and work through that yourself, try and convince yourself that it's correct. Um, and then I just went ahead and I traced out um, in orange exactly what this would look like for the Smith-Waterman alignment. Um, and so again, you can see we're just following those arrows starting from the highest scoring cell until we reach a zero in that matrix. And those two, that alignment that I transcribed is down at the bottom. Um, similar to how we scored a Needleman Wench alignment, um, we score a Smith Waterman alignment based on the value that is in the cell that we started from. Um, this is actually the same as for Needleman Wench. Um, so with Needleman Wench, we would uh, we gave our alignment a score of one because we started transcribing here um, when we when we did our trace back. Um, now we start transcribing at 28, and so that's the score of the Smith Waterman alignment. One thing that I should point out about that is the scores from these two algorithms are not directly comparable. So like this doesn't isn't telling us something like Smith Waterman got a better score and so is a better alignment than the Needleman Wunsch. These are algorithms that have different goals and so we don't directly compare them to one another. The score that we get is also a function of the sequences that we're aligning, the substitution matrix that we're using, and the gap penalties that we're using. Um, and so it's also generally not very informative to compare scores um, aligning different pairs of sequences. So you may wonder what these scores are even useful for at all then. Well, we're gonna come back to that in the next lectures. Okay, the other modification that I wanted to make, uh, or that I wanted to mention, is a modification that's used for what's known as affine gap scoring. And this can be applied either to Needleman Wunsch or to Smith Waterman. Um, so I'm going to look at some examples here that are based on Smith Waterman, but these uh, modifications, like I said, can also be applied to the scoring functions for Needleman Wunsch. Um, and so this is the scoring scheme that we just looked at here. Um, and so what you should notice about this one is that there's a single gap penalty that is applied. And so that is this value D that we used um, when we were computing those bottom two cells. Now, this is generally considered to not be um, very biologically relevant because the way, the way that we um, 
the way that these types of gaps uh, happen is that one mutation event can lead to a gap uh, uh, of uh, can lead to a deletion or an insertion of multiple nucleotides at a time. Um, uh, or, uh, yeah, multiple nucleotides or amino acids, depending on what type of alignment we're looking at. The mutation itself, of course, occurs at the um, DNA level. Um, but because a single mutation event can lead to a gap of, say, say 10 nucleotides or 10 uh, amino acids, um, it doesn't necessarily make sense to get the same penalty every time you encounter a gap, um, because that means that one mutation event could end up with a huge penalty if it results in a longer, um, uh, a longer gap than, say, another mutation might have. And so the way that we get around this, and this is um, almost always used in, um, in practice by default, um, is we use this affine gap scoring system. Um, and what this means is that there are two penalties that are applied. The first one I refer to as DO, and that is used when a new gap is opened. And so like the first dash character that you would insert in a sequence would incur um, a DO penalty. And DE is used when an existing gap is extended. And so if you have opened a gap and you're just making it longer, you typically would incur a smaller penalty than when you first initially opened that gap. And so the D, um, DO would typically be a higher value or really would always be a higher value than DE. So creating a new gap incurs a big old, bigger penalty than extending the length of an existing gap. Um, we're not going to work through an example with this, um, but in the book, you will go through an example of doing, um, I believe in the book it is uh, Needleman Wench with affine gap scoring that is used, um, but I may be wrong about that. Um, okay, so that wraps up what I wanted to talk about um, regarding these modifications of the algorithm that we looked at last time. Um, so the next thing I want to do is start talking about pairwise alignment and uh, how, how that scales in terms of runtime with the um, length of the sequences that are provided as input. Okay, so what I want to do to start exploring runtime is jump in and use some code. Um, and if you want to follow along with this, this is from the pairwise alignment chapter of the book. And so I've just pre-populated a Jupyter notebook um, using some of the information from the book. Um, the first thing I want to do is I want to introduce a function that we're going to use um, from the scikit bio library called local pairwise align nucleotide. And so as you can probably imagine, um, this runs a Smith-Waterman alignment. So that's where the local comes in. And specifically, it's aligning nucleotide sequences to one another. Again, like I mentioned um, in the previous lectures, these algorithms work just as well on proteins and, um, uh, proteins and nucleotides. And so that's why I go back and forth between using them um, in these lectures. So, what this function does is given two sequences, and so here I'm calling these seq1 and seq2. These are both DNA sequences um, from the scikit bio library. Um, you may notice I'm using DNA here, but I'm not specifically importing it. That's because it was imported earlier um, in this notebook. Um, so when I call this function local pairwise align nucleotide, I have to provide two sequences and then I provide a gap open penalty and a gap extend penalty. This is what I just talked about um, when we were looking at that affine gap uh, scoring system. And so we have two different penalties here, one for opening a gap, one for extending an existing gap. This function then returns an alignment, which I'm abbreviating here as ALN. It returns the score of the alignment, 
and it returns a data structure that contains the start and end positions for both of these sequences in the alignment. Um, remember, because this is a local alignment, they're not necessarily aligned from beginning to end. So let's go ahead and run that, and then we can expect, inspect the output. Um, so that ran. Um, I didn't get any output, and that's because I don't have any print statements in here, and I am not, um, uh, uh, I'm not I'm assigning everything that I evaluate to variables um, and so I'm gonna insert a new cell below here and the first thing I want to do is I want to just inspect that alignment variable get a look at it um, what this is telling me here is that this is another scikit bio object called tabular MSA for multiple sequence alignment um, it's telling me that there are two sequences in here because this is a pairwise alignment. Um, and it's telling me that the length of the alignment is 49 positions. Um, it's then showing me the aligned sequence one and the aligned sequence two. And so you can see that we had a few gaps um, inserted in a couple of different spots in this alignment. Um, the other thing that this cell gives me um, is it gives me the score of the alignment. Um, we talked about those, but we haven't talked yet about why you care. Um, but this score for this alignment was 56. Now, there's a really handy um, function that is built into Jupyter and IPython called timeit. Um, and if I were to call timeit, on this local pairwise align nucleotide function. Um, what it does is it runs that um, several times and it computes the average time. And so that's why this is taking longer than before. Um, and uh, then what it does is it reports the runtime for computing the pairwise alignment between sequence one and sequence two. And so if I interpret these results, this is telling me it took 114 milliseconds plus or minus six milliseconds um, per iteration. Um, and then it is, um, I, don't, I actually don't know how to interpret all of this, like what the runs versus loops are here. Um, but basically, like I said, this is telling us that it took about 104 milliseconds to run. Now, Think about that just for a minute. It always sort of blows my mind how fast that actually is. Because remember what's happening here is that it is constructing those matrices, putting one sequence on one axis, one sequence on the other axis, running through that entire scoring scheme, and then tracing back the alignment. Um, and so it just always amazes me that you can get that much done or the computer can get that much done in 114 milliseconds. And I think that just is a good way to remind ourselves of how fast computers are at carrying out these kinds of mathematical operations. Um, all of that said, I actually happen to know because I'm, I'm very familiar with the scikit bio library that that is actually a slow implementation of that algorithm and that scikit bio has a faster one um, and that one is called local pairwise align ssw um, and so this is um, a, a function that does something very similar it's optimized um, for better runtime and so it's actually i believe under the hood implemented in another language called c plus plus which tends to be a lot faster than Python. And so let's go ahead and align sequence one and sequence two again and time that. Um, so again, this is just gonna take a minute um, to go through a bunch of iterations. Um, and if we look at that, um, first thing you might see is 552 versus 114, um, but notice the units here. And so the unit is microsecond in this case. And so that is um, you know, basically on the order of a thousand times faster than the local pairwise aligned nucleotide. And so even more um, impressive that it is doing all of that work in, um, in microseconds basically.
Um, so the next thing you should probably always wonder is, well, it's doing it a lot faster. Is it doing it as well? Um, so let's go ahead and just look at the multiple sequence alignment that we get from each of these two methods. And so you'll know, you'll notice what I'm doing here is I'm calling local pairwise aligned nucleotide, so the slow version first, um, and then I am calling local pairwise line SSW, and so the fast version second. Um, and if I compare these, you can see um, both of these are length 49 alignments. It looks like the gaps are inserted in exactly the same place. And so based on this quick test, um, that tells me that these two methods are generating the exact same alignment. Now, if I were really benchmarking these against each other, of course, I would want to do this on many more sequences um, under many um, varied circumstances, but we're just trying to get a quick look here for the purpose of this lecture. So next, so let's work with this local pairwise line SSW for the next um, steps of this little analysis we're going to do. Um, the first thing that I want to do here is um, because we're just trying to do some evaluation of how long this is going to take, I don't really care what sequences we're working with, and I don't really feel like defining a whole bunch of sequences. And so I'm going to define a function called random sequence that takes a molecule type and a length. Um, and then what this does is based on that molecule type, it generates a sequence of the specified length. And so I will go ahead and execute that cell. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out some random sequences using that. Um, and so the first sequence I'm printing is 10 nucleotides long. And you can see the first one that gets printed out is indeed 10 nucleotides long. Um, I said that this was these should be DNA sequences. And so these uh, only have A's, C's, G's, and T's in them. The next uh, line here, I said, give me another 10 base sequence. And so just let me convince me that this is random. Um, and so if I look at that, you can see that I'm getting another 10 base sequence here. Um, and so that is um, two different length 10 sequences. Now I get one of length 25 and one of length 50. Um, and if you sort of visually keep those in your head, I can run this again. And you can see that we're going to get different sequences this next time. We're going to get different sequences again. Um, if we keep running this, we'll see that those sequences are changing. Um, OK, so what I'm going to do now is I am going to compute the runtime for sequences that are of greater length than what we've been working with so far. Um, and so you'll remember the range function um, is going to give me um, a list of values beginning with start up to but not including the end in sizes of step. And so what I'm doing here is I'm saying give me numbers from 5,000 to 110,000 in steps of 20,000. Um, and so these are going to be sequence lengths that I generate. And so these would be, you know, much more um, realistic sequence lengths. And so starting on the order of, say, um, a large gene sequence up to the length of, um, you know, say a small genome, maybe like a viral genome. Um, I am going to, um, don't worry so much about what's going on here, but basically what I'm doing is I am... Um, having it generate random sequences of the specified lengths and align them. And then I'm going to compute a table um, of, the, um, uh, of those runtimes. And so I'm going to run this cell. And this one we should expect to take a little bit longer than the cells that we've run before. Because what's happening now is it's computing um, pairwise alignments of sequences that in some cases are going to be up to about 100,000 um, bases long. Um, and so these are going to be 100,000 by 100,000 matrices. Um, and, you know, it would take us 
you know, more time than any of us have um, to compute those matrices. It's going to take the computer just a few seconds. Um, so I think this should be wrapping up um, any second now, but we'll just give it another minute and wait for it. Okay, it looks like we're done. Um, and so we should now have computed all of those, and I'm going to run this next cell here, which is using um, another Python library called Pandas. Um, and this is now telling us the runtime in seconds um, for each of these length alignments. Um, and so the um, length 5000 alignment, the average runtime was about a quarter of a second. For the alignment of sequences of length 25,000, um, we were at about one and a half seconds. 45,000, we were at about three and a half seconds. 65,000, about five and a half seconds. 85,000, about eight seconds. And 100,000, about 10 seconds. Um, and so the run times are increasing as the sequence length is increasing. Probably any one of us could have guessed that. Um, but what we really care about here is how the runtimes are increasing as a function of the sequence length. And there's a few ways that this could be increasing. Um, and so if there were a linear relationship between the sequence length and the runtime, then the runtime would be um, approximately equal to like some constant times the sequence length. We would describe that as a linear runtime. A quadratic runtime is um, what we would call um, when runtime is a function of a constant times the square of a sequence length. Um, and so that starts getting a little bit more um, problematic, that's going to increase a lot a lot more quickly than a linear runtime. Um, an exponential runtime would be where the runtime increases as a function of some constant raised to the power of sequence length. Um, and so as you can imagine, that would probably increase extraordinarily quickly. It would get uh, out of control very quickly. Um, so in order to get an idea of what our runtime looks like, um, we can generate a figure. Um, and the figure that I have here um, that gets printed here um, sort of looks to me um, like it is starting to approach a um, quadratic relationship. Um, and so, um, the um, it you can't really get a great glimpse of it here. Um, what I might do is um, increase the size of our largest sequence lengths and rerun this, um, and we'll see what it looks like then. Okay, so I just paused the recording for about an hour and I went back and I modified the range of sequence lengths that I was evaluating. I did that because the curve wasn't quite showing exactly what I wanted, and so I hypothesized that maybe I didn't um, run this on sequences that were long enough. Um, and so the range that I tried this time, again, I started at a sequence length of 5,000. This time I went up to 500,000 in steps of 20,000. Uh, and so in addition to working with much longer sequences this time, I'm also doing a lot more steps, and so that should fill our curve in a little bit more. So if I scroll down to this table, um, you'll see again I start at 5,000. This time I go up to 500,000. Um, and when I look at the plot that gets generated, um, you can see that there is clearly some curvature in that plot now um, that suggests that this algorithm is scaling quadratically. Um, so remember that what I'm looking for is trying to figure out if runtime, my y-axis here, is a linear, quadratic, or exponential function of sequence length. So sequence length is my x-axis, um, and you can see this is starting to look like a, a quadratic curve that I have here. This makes sense when you think about how pairwise alignment works. Um, so when we compute alignment of a pair of sequences, 
we're always putting one sequence on each axis and then the number of cells that we have to fill in is the length of the sequence on the horizontal axis times the length of the sequence on the vertical axis. Um, and so it makes sense that the runtime of this algorithm scales as a square of the sequence lengths because as we, um, as we increase the sequence length, we are um, uh, uh, basically like squaring those to figure out how many cells we're gonna have to compute in the matrix. Um, so you might think, okay, well, that's fine. Um, you know, computers are fast, so maybe, you know, this uh, scaling um, slowly isn't such a big deal. Can't we just run this on more processors? Um, and the issue there is that even if we were to run this, say, on four processors, that might divide the runtime by four, but it is still going to be a quadratic relationship. Um, so dividing by a factor like 4 or 8 or 16 or however many processors you want to run on isn't going to change the computational complexity of this algorithm. It will change the runtime, but we still might hit a problem at some point if we wanted to do this on very long sequences. Um, down here, what I did was um, I computed what the parallel run times would be. And so I basically said, like, if we could effectively reduce the runtime um, uh, down to a quarter of the um, original runtime, how would that impact the, the curve? And so you can see um, my run times are going down much smaller. But of course, this curve shape is still exactly the same. Um, okay, so the takeaway from this little bit is that pairwise sequence alignment scales quadratically as a function of the input sequence lengths. When we, um, for doing, say, a few pairwise alignments, this isn't really such a big deal, but it could be a big deal if we needed to align very many, very long sequences. Um, there are also some other um, issues that could arise if we wanted to align, say, one sequence of a, of a fixed length against very many sequences, um, as might happen if you were doing a database search. So over the next, um, well, so effect, so what has had to happen here um, is that the field has had to try and identify optimizations of this algorithm that we refer to as heuristic approaches. Uh, and so what you would do in a heuristic approach is you would find some way to reduce the values that you had to compute. And so instead of having to compute that whole matrix, compute only subsections of that matrix. And the idea with a heuristic is that you would want to um, still get the right answer, at least most of the time, um, and you would want to greatly decrease the runtime so that it's worth that heuristic, it's worth, um, uh, it's worth using even if every once in a while you might not get the exact right answer because um, you, uh, say, haven't computed that whole matrix. And so maybe there's some better alignment in there that you just haven't noticed. Um, anyway, I'm starting to get into what we're going to be talking about in the next series of lectures. And so I'm going to leave it there for right now um, and just uh, hint at the fact that we will be revisiting the idea of heuristic algorithms to deal with the fact that pairwise sequence alignment and other sequence alignment approaches can be a little bit too slow to use all the time in practice. We do use them very regularly, including the algorithms that I presented over these last few lectures, but sometimes we have to figure out how to optimize them for problems where we're dealing with bigger data sets. Okay, I'm going to wrap up there and I will see you next time.